Good morning. We are today in First Peter. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. So if you turn your Bibles there, First Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 25, we're going to finish the passage. And it says this, If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. So, most of us here are old enough to know that all of us humans, or not all of us, but humans in general, have a very high and sinful appreciation for temporal things. Uh, so, for me, at the beginning of the year 1999, this was my college year, my, my uh, freshman year in college in Mexico. My parents gave me a brand new Ford Mustang GT. I mean, it was, it was an amazing car. It was a red exterior with a black interior, uh, manual transmission. If you're into cars, you know manual transmission is the way to go for a sports car. And, and, and for a while, it was the only Mustang in my neighborhood and also at my school, so it was, it was, a, it was a symbol of status, to say the least, at least for me. And, you know, it felt like a dream because uh, I was not riding the bus like most of my friends. I was not driving my parents' hand-me-down beater. I had a very expensive car, a muscle car. I knew it, and the people around me knew it. So that made me feel really good. And I remember taking care of that car, excellent care. I mean, like, I went all the way. Uh, taking care of that car. I washed it every week. Didn't wash myself. I take him to the car wash every week. I had it detailed twice a year, and I kept up with all the recommended manufacturers' uh, scheduled maintenance. So I spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort keeping that car because it was my treasure. It was literally my treasure. And then that summer, my pride took a, a small hit because I transferred uh, to study in the States, and I brought my car with me, because uh, it's my treasure. And very soon after I arrived to El Paso, I found that mine was not the only Mustang around. However, it was a sti still a very nice car. I mean, like, all the other Mustangs were not manual transmission, which is what set me apart. So then, as the years, as the years went by, Obviously, the effects of wear and tear began to become more and more evident. And despite my best efforts, dents and noises began to appear. And the interior, my seat became worn and discolored. And, and people were no longer impressed by, by my car because there were newer and better cars around. So that symbol of status that had come to me just a few years before just faded away. And about 10 years later, I sent that car back to Mexico where it was finally sold. My, my dad sold it to someone. So my treasure was finally gone. But thankfully, by then, the Lord had sent me another treasure, one treasure that is not going to fail or fade or break, because this treasure is going to last forever. This is the gift of redemption and eternal life. That's my actual treasure. That's our treasure. 
And this gift that the Lord sent me came with many privileges, and it also comes with responsibilities that we all fulfill out, with, out of gratitude and love. And we're going to see that exemplified in this section of Scripture. So in our previous lessons, Peter urged us believers to prepare our minds by filling them with Scripture. He told us that we must keep sober in spirit, and he's admonishing us to fix our hope on the second coming of Christ and to devote ourselves to holiness. And now, here in verse 17, Peter is going to tell us that we must live in fear. This is an interesting statement, so we're going we're gonna to see what this means. So Peter wrote in verse 17, If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. So as I mentioned in our previous lesson, through faith in Christ, believers have been adopted into the family of God. This means that all Christians and only Christians are children of God. So I need you to understand, because this is, this is said and repeated in different contexts, that we're all, are, we're all children of God. That is not the truth. Only those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and have been adopted into his family through faith in the Lord are children of, of God. So Christians and only Christians can call God Father. However, some may think that this, uh, this is a license to sin. This is a license to do whatever we want. And that is, not, that is not correct. Being a child of God is not a license to sin, and it is not a license to do whatever we pleased. Please, we must not make the mistake of believing that we can live the rest of our lives indulging in sinful pleasures just because has, Christ has paid for it all already. That's not the case. That's not what this means. Peter tells us here that regardless of our privileged status before God as adoptive children of God, Disobedience will not be tolerated because God does not have favorites. God is not only our infinite, gracious, and merciful, loving Father, He's also an impartial judge who judges according to one's work. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul gives us a little bit more clarity about this judgment that Peter is talking about. So Paul wrote, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each, of, each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. What, what these uh, apostles are saying is that one day, each and every one of us will be face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ to give an account for our lives. And that's going to be a very rough day, even for those whose sins have been forgiven and have been declared righteous, because God is going to see, is going to judge everything we did. Everything we did, every action, every thought, every, every, every word is going to come to light, and it is going to be judged by God. And in light of this judgment, believers must conduct themselves in fear during their time of their stay here on earth. Now, in order to better understand what Peter is saying here, it is necessary for us to take a quick look at the Greek word phobo. And this word can be translated as uh, something terrible or awe-inspiring. And it can also mean terror, or it can also mean fear. So the NASB, which is what I'm reading from, the ESV, and even the King James, they correctly translate phobo as fear. However, when the word phobo is preceded by the Greek conjunction hen, that in English means with, the meaning changes to reverence or respect. Therefore, Peter here is not telling us, he's not saying that we must live our lives in absolute terror. That's not the fear that he's talking about because this would be completely inconsistent with God's love for his children. What Peter is actually saying here is that we must conduct ourselves with reverent awe of God during our time of our stay here on earth. 
So he's not talking about terror. He's not talking about fear the way we think about it. It's talking about a reverent awe. So this is the same kind of awe that a son has toward his beloved parents, or should have. And this is the kind of awe that motivates a child to stay clear from any kind of behavior that would displease or grieve his parents. When I was younger with my brother, um, my brother and I, we always knew that my mom loved us very much. And some of you know my mom. My mom is just a little tiny thing, very thin. She has always been like that. And uh, you wouldn't believe it, but she's, she's capable of great rage. <laughs> and my brother and I knew that she was very skilled at turning any object within her grasp into a rod of correction. <laughs> and we also knew that she was very skilled at imparting this correction uh, at, at short, medium, or long range. So, so this knowledge of what my mom was capable of, um, this reverential fear that we had for her motivated us to abstain from doing things that made her upset. It kept us in line. So that's the, that's the kind of awe that we're talking about. We, we, we don't do things that displease our parents, our father, because we know that there can be consequences, and those consequences would be painful. So, so we didn't fear her, we loved her, but we respected her, and we conducted ourselves accordingly. Now the phrase, during the time of our stay on earth, implies that we are here temporarily. The earth is not our home. This is not our final home. Believers are sojourners. We are temporal residents on earth. I think that Dan made a, a comment about this some time ago. Jeanette, for some time, was a permanent resident of the States. This was not her permanent home. She, 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 she belonged in, in the Netherlands. Like I was a permanent resident once, now I'm a citizen, and so is she, so now this is her home. So our citizenship as believers is not on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we look forward to the day when the Lord will finally bring us to our eternal home in heaven. But in the meantime, we are here. This is our temporary home. So while we are here, temporarily, our lives must be characterized by faithfulness and obedience to God. Just like us, you know, aliens before, we had to have certain conduct, otherwise we'll be kicked out from the States. That's it's the same concept. Now, in the next verse, Peter explains the reason why believers should live in reverent fear of God. So he wrote in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Here, we go again to the Greek to get uh, more light into this uh, verse. The Greek word elutrotheite, means uh, to, free by, to, be, uh, to free someone by paying a ransom. It means also to redeem or to set free. And it also can mean to rescue, depending on what context you're using the word in. So the, the, the Jews were, ve were very well acquainted with this term because when they heard the, the term redemption, elutrotheite, uh, what, they, what immediately came to their minds was the exodus. That, that, that's, what, that's what they thought about. This is the time when God liberated Israel from Egypt. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, which is the Gentiles, uh, a person, a prisoner of war, a slave specifically, a, 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 yeah, a slave or a prisoner of war could be redeemed, meaning that they could be freed if someone paid a ransom for them, whether it was themselves or someone else. So they could be free by, by paying an amount of money. And what Peter is doing here, he's reminding his audience of the infinite cost of our redemption, of our liberation, the infinite cost of setting us free. Now, here someone could ask, well, liberation from what? What are we being set free from? Well, the answer is liberation from our futile way of life inherited from our forefathers. Some of us, like me, who have been saved, who were saved uh, later in life, were able to remember the futility and emptiness of our lives before our salvation. I just gave you a description of how my life was before when I was worshiping my car. All of us, before Christ, we were enslaved to sin. 
We were spiritually dead, and we were completely devoted to false gods. That was us. We lived to please ourselves, whether we knew it or not. That's, that's what we're, we're living for, for ourselves and nothing else. So in this verse, Peter is telling us that this way of life was handed down from generation to generation. This is what Christ liberated us from. And I see this in my own life. On my father's side of the family, my great-grandmother was a Roman Catholic. She attended mass regularly, but she did not own a Bible. Then my grandparents were also Roman Catholic. They rarely attended mass. They did own a Bible, but they did not read it. And then my parents were also Roman Catholic. They never attended mass. They did not own a Bible. So then I grow up, and then I was a Roman Catholic, but I was a Roman Catholic by tradition, not by conviction. So my religion, as you can see, was inherited. It was not acquired. I was traditionally a Roman Catholic, so I was just keeping the tradition going. But even if my family had been absolutely devout and sincere in their commitment to the Roman Catholic Church or any other religion for that matter, that faith, that tradition, that loyalty, that commitment would have been worthless because tradition and loyalty and sincerity or devotion and faith in the wrong object or in the wrong person are not able to save at all. It is only through Christ and Christ alone that sinners can be saved. Only Christ can liberate us from the bondage of sin. Not money, not, not our, our character, not our thoughts, nor our feelings, nor our commitment. Christ and Christ alone can give us spiritual freedom. He can only give us, he's the only one that can give us a spiritual life. And here, there's one more important point to be made for my students and the youth. Guys, you have to be aware of the inherited Christianity. Just because your parents are believers doesn't mean that you are automatically a believer. Just because you're being raised in a Christian home does not mean that you're automatically saved. You must have a personal faith in Jesus Christ. You must have a personal relationship with the Lord in order to, in order to be truly saved and enter the kingdom of heaven. This is between you and the Lord. Your parents have nothing to do with it. Your parents are raising you, but that's not going to save you. Your personal faith is what actually will bring you to the Lord. Now, back in... In the beginning of verse 18, back in our text, Peter told us that the price that the Lord Jesus Christ paid to ransom his people is infinitely more valuable than an enduring that silver and gold. And now here in verse 19, Peter tells us that the price was the blood of Christ. Peter wrote in verse 19, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. In this verse, we have to understand the import, importance or the relevance of the blood. According to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and blood is necessary to make atonement. Peter is using this Old Testament imagery when he compares Christ to a lamb, unblemish, a lamb unblemished and spotless. So Peter's purpose here is to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is sinless, that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, and that makes him, of course, a perfect sacrifice. And since Peter is emphasizing the words unblemished and spotless, it is safe to assume that the image that Peter is presenting here for his audience is that of the Passover. This, uh, this image of the Passover is especially fitting for two reasons. The first one, is that this image of, of uh, the Lamb of God is commonly found in the New Testament. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three examples. Number one, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Second example, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the third example is from the same chapter of John in verse 36. John the Baptist looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. So the second 
um, argument to assume that this is, uh, that Peter is talking about the Passover, is that the Passover was a central part of Israel's liberation of, from Egypt. Remember I was mentioning that when, when the, the, the audience would hear redemption, they would immediately think about the Exodus, the Passover. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 18 says, But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. So, as I mentioned, the blood is precious because the life of the flesh is in the blood. No one can live without blood. Therefore, the shedding of blood signifies death. And in this case, it indicates that Christ gave up his life for sinners like you and me. Peter here is contrasting the perishability of silver and gold with the preciousness of Christ's blood. The point here is that we were not purchased with the precious metals or objects that are only valuable to men. We were redeemed by the blood of Christ, the unblemished and spotless Lamb of God who died as a ransom for many. There's not enough wealth, there is not enough precious material things that can compare to the blood of the Savior. That is the point. So a reverential awe for God is not based solely on the recognition of impending judgment, on the knowledge that God may be disciplining us or punishing us. A recognition, a reverential awe for God is based on a deep gratitude for what God has done for us. God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for us, the elect. The son of God came to die on our behalf. He laid down his life for us willingly. He bore the wrath that was due to us. He paid the price we could never pay. The sinless, innocent man died so that you and I could live. Now, most of, most of us have heard these statements before repeatedly. And the reason I am bringing them up today again is because they're relevant to our text, but also because we need to be constantly reminded of these things. The Lord says throughout the scriptures, remember, 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 we are forgetful. I myself need to be reminded of this in my life. My life is not my own. I was bought at a price. And the result of this knowledge must be our eternal gratitude, our deepest love, and our unconditional obedience to the Lord. That's the proper reaction. The price that was made for our redemption was not an accident. It was not a second thought. It was not a surprise to God. It was not part of a plan B. It was part of God's plan all along. Verse 20 says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Here again, we go to the Greek for clarity. The verb proegnosmeno um, is translated in our Bibles as he was foreknown. And this suggests that Christ was or is pre-existent, meaning that he existed before the foundation of the world. This, uh, this notion of Christ's pre-existence is confirmed in the second half of this same verse by the word phanerothentos, which means to cause to become some, uh, visible. It also means to reveal or to make known. And the key here to understand this word and the whole passage is that whatever is being revealed, whatever is being phanerothentos, it already exists. So it is there, but it is unseen. So in this case, this word phanerothentos is telling us that Christ already existed and he's uh, being visible now. So he's revealed to us through his incarnation. The point that Peter is making here is that God determined before the creation of the world that Christ, who was already there with him, would come as a redeemer at a specific point in time. That the Son of God would come in the eschaton, in the last times. So these last times refer to the last times or the last days of salvation history. 
This is the period of time that began with the birth of Christ and will conclude with his second coming. That's why we are living in the last times. It's not that, that you know, we are like right at the end. This is like we're, we're in the home stretch. And Peter ends this verse adding the phrase, for the sake of you. And this phrase is added here to emphasize the monumental blessing and privilege that it is for us believers to be living in this time when God is fulfilling his promises to save his people. If you remember in previous lessons, we we're talking about how the prophets longed to see. They were searching the scriptures, trying to figure out what are, what's the meaning of these prophecies that we gave. I have one of my DTS professors that said that when we go to heaven, he thinks that the people, the Old Testament people like Moses and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they're going to be more preoccupied about hearing from us than we would be from them because we have a different experience that they did. We have the whole revelation of God here in the scriptures. We're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. These are experiences that they did not have. We know Jesus Christ by name, what he did, his ministry, everything. They did not live to see that. This is what we're referring to. We, it is a tremendous blessing to live in these times when these promises of salvation are being fulfilled. Peter then continues in verse 21 saying, Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. If you remember... We also mentioned previously that Peter wrote this letter to encourage believers in Asia Minor because they were going through very severe persecution from the Roman Empire, from Nero. So there is no question that these believers were going through severe suffering. I mean, there were very rough times. So what Peter is doing here, he's reminding them of whom they have placed their hope and faith in. Our faith as believers is in God through Christ. And the reason we believe in God is because of the work and of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this God in whom we believe is the same God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory. That is a tremendous encouragement. But there's more. The same God that allowed his son, his only begotten son, to suffer will also allow us to suffer. We already saw this in a previous lesson. Suffering is part of this equation. It's part of the Christian life. And this same God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory is the same God who will resurrect and glorify all those who believe in his Son. The same God who vindicated and glorified Jesus Christ after all of his sufferings is the same God who will also vindicate and glorify all believers after our sufferings. That is the hope that we have. That is the God that we believe in. So all of us believers have been called to live a holy life, a life that is different, separate from the world. Believers are called to trust in the promises and on the goodness of God. And as I mentioned before, this is not an easy task. It requires intentional effort and concentration. Why? Well, because if you want to know what God promised, if you want to know how God manifests his goodness and how costly was our salvation, we must go to the scriptures and study them diligently. And the effort is to carve some time from our very busy lives to actually dig in and study and see for ourselves. You cannot know a person by just hearing about that person. You cannot have a relationship with them without actually having this conversation and getting to know them. The Lord revealed himself in written form through the scriptures. This is the way we know him. If we want to know about him and his character and his actions and his promises, we need to open the scriptures and read. Now, in the next verse, Peter's focus shifts from the individual to the community. In the previous verses, Peter called us to live a holy life. And now he's going to focus on the proper relationships among church members. So in verse 22, Peter wrote, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love 
one another from the heart. So in this verse, the verb purified is a perfect participle. Why am I mentioning this? Well, because it, it's important because in, it indicates that a past action has ongoing consequences. So the verb purified is referring to our salvation. So it refers to our conversion. So this is how this works. Peter is expressing here that our justification or our salvation, which happened in the past, has ongoing consequences here in the present through our sanctification, which is the process by which we are progressively being made more like Christ. So our salvation, which happened in the past, still has ramifications today through our sanctification. So that's how we are purified. That's the importance of the participle, the perfect participle in purified. So all believers, all of us are purified through our obedience to the truth. We are saved through our submission to the gospel. And here I need to remind us once again that a person does not become a Christian through obedience and obedience alone. It is our faith, our trust, and our love in Christ that produces obedience in a Christian. It is God who gives us the faith to believe in his Son, who sends us the Holy Spirit to help us understand and give us the ability and the desire to obey his word. It is not us, it is all God. Nothing, nothing was of us. This is all a gift that came from God. And the result of our transformation, the result of the purification of our hearts, is a sincere love of the brethren. It is a genuine love for fellow believers. Peter ends this verse with a command that intensifies this love for fellow believers. He said, fervently love one another from the heart. This is not an option. This is something that has to be done, regardless of how difficult it is. The scriptures command us to sincerely love one another in the fact that in fact, the Lord Jesus said in, in uh, John 13, 34, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, you, so you must love one another. As I was saying, love for each other is not optional. This is a command. And in this case, it's a command from the Lord himself. This love with which Jesus loves us is self-sacrificial love. It is unconditional love. He doesn't love us more or less when we obey or disobey. He doesn't say, well, if you are in the word regularly, I'm going to love you more. If you're not, then I'm, and that's not the way it works. God loves us. Christ loves us the same all the time. And we are called to give the best of ourselves for the sake of the other person without expecting anything in return. The love that believers have for one another must be constant and must be undeterred by any kind of trouble or painful circumstance. Unconditional, at all times, loving the same. Then in verse 23, Peter explains that the command to love one another is rooted in the saving work of Jesus Christ. He wrote, for you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. Now, this, uh, in this part, I think it is safe to assume that all of us here, hopefully, uh, we know how reproduction works, right? And just in case anyone forgot, we are going to make a very quick and simple and not very awkward review of how human reproduction works. So men have seeds called sperm, and women have eggs called ovum. And when the seed joins the egg, a baby is created, right? So end of review. All of us here <laughs> were born from the seed of our fathers, which according to scripture is perishable and corrupt. Even if this seed is able to produce children, it is, it is, it is corrupt and perishable because eventually all of us will die. So that is our first birth. We all were born like this. But those of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have been born again. And we have been born again from a seed 
that is different. This seed is imperishable and it's incorruptible. Now the question is, what is this imperishable and incorruptible seed that made us to be born again? Well, the answer is this, the living and enduring word of God. It's the gospel. God begets his people through the preaching of the gospel. That's how we are born again. This is the issue that Nicodemus could not understand, the second birth. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The word of God is effective. It has the power to create. It has the power to regenerate. It has the power to give life. And it endures forever. This is the seed that Christians are born from. Then in verses 24 and 25, Peter quotes Isaiah chapter 40 from the second half of verse 6 through verse 8, but from the Septuagint. And he does this to contrast the impermanence of creation to the eternal endurance of the Word of God. So he, he quoted, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Peter's focus here continues to be, of course, on the word of God, which endures forever, and it never loses its effectiveness. The word of God, as we all know, is eternal, it's faithful, it's powerful, and it always keeps what it promises just like the God who spoke that word. It is through the preaching of the word, of this word, that people may come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It is through the preaching of this word that sinners receive eternal life and hope. That's how we became believers, from hearing the word of God, from a pulpit, from a peer, you name it. Before I go on, I have something to say. I remember now that I saw Doug and Rachel. This is how I became saved. I was going, I was coming to church and listening here and there and, you know, upset at some people, happy at some others. And we were in a ministry group one night and the Freiburgers were asking for prayer for a Hispanic guy that was dating a white girl. And they're telling all this story that is exactly what was happening in my life. But I didn't know them at that time. I knew who they were, but that was it. And they're describing my entire life situation to the dot. And after that time, I thought, everything I've been hearing, everything I've been reading and I've been told, it has to be true. I believe it was that night, through the ministry of other people, what others were saying, I wasn't really reading the Bible. I had one, I had read it, but that was really not making the effect. It was what I heard from others that actually brought me to life. So that, that's, that's, that's the way it works. Anyway. Let me close with a word of application. In this section, we saw that if you claim to be a believer, your actions, your word, and your lifestyle must match your profession of faith. Unfortunately, there are many who go through life pretending and professing to be children of God. Their deeds and their actions may seem convincing to those around them, but, but beware. God cannot be deceived because he sees into the depths of our hearts. You see, God's judgment is not determined by our outward appearance. It is not determined simply by our actions or professions of faith. Instead, it is determined by our character, by the contents of our hearts. When I was a young believer, I took, um, unbeliever, not believer, unbeliever, I took such good care of my Mustang because as I said, it was my treasure. I lived for money. I lived for status. That's what I was worshiping. I was living for myself. But the Lord says in Matthew chapter 9, verses 19 through 21, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We all act according to what we believe, we protect, and we foster what we hold dear. And God is concerned not only with our actions, but also with our internal motivations behind those actions. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you say what you say? Why you behave the way you do? 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, the Lord Jesus said that the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Whatever is in you, whatever you believe, whatever convicts you is going to come out. People are going to know what's inside. That's what the Lord is telling us here. Consequently, if the Lord and his word are in your heart, if you are indeed indwelled by the Holy Spirit, there will be evidence of it. Probably much, probably not much, but sooner or later, there's something going to be going on there. It's going to be evident that you are a new creation. Peter told us here that one consequence or evidence of our salvation is love for one another. Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, that you are mine, if you have love for one another. Then in 14, 15, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you belong to me, you're going to do what I ask you. Finally, in Romans 12, verse 2, Paul said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. As I mentioned before, one day our actions and our motives will be all laid bare before the Lord. And we need to remember as we walk through this world, that we were bought at a price, that we are not our own. And as I answer, ask my students periodically, what do you have that you did not receive? So with this in mind, we need to act accordingly. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is something that, that we mention, it's something that we say, and we cannot comprehend. Um, the price is more than we can even fathom, and yet uh, we are thankful for that. We thank you for um, the forgiveness that we have in your Son. We thank you, Lord, for, for everything we have. We recognize that everything comes from your hand, as this passage says, there's nothing that we have that was not handed down from you. So we thank you, Lord, for all that. We thank you most specially for our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.